Hi, this is Professor Fernandez, and in this video, we're going to work through an example of using a partial fractions decomposition. This example comes from the lesson notes from lesson 24 in this Calculus 2 course. You'll find those notes on this website and also these resources. So I'm going to zoom in to the lower right hand corner of the screen here to just give you um, an opportunity to read through this. You might want to pause the video. Um, these are the guidelines for decomposing a rational function. So polynomial divided by polynomial. Um, and the idea here behind partial fractions is that, first of all, you want to make sure that the rational function you're dealing with is a proper fraction. So in other words, the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator. So something like x squared over x cubed plus x squared plus 7, that works. Proper fraction. Degree of the numerator here is 2. That's less than the degree of the denominator here, that's 3. Something like x squared over x squared plus 1, or even you know x to the 7th over x squared plus 1. Um, both of these are improper fractions because the degree of the numerator is uh, bigger than, that's this case, or equal to, that's this case, the degree of the denominator. Um, so when that happens, um, partial fractions requires that you first make it into a proper fraction. So um, we'll talk about techniques for doing that in the next video, actually. Um, we'll remember um, long division and synthetic division. Those are the two main techniques used in calculus for converting an, an improper rational function into a proper one. Uh, but for this video, we're going to start um, semi-easy uh, and just skip this first step. We'll deal only with a proper uh, fraction. So step number two, then, after you've either verified or gotten your rational function into a proper fraction, is to apply the partial fractions technique. Um, there are three possibilities for the purposes of what we do in Calculus 2 of using partial fractions. Um, and if you already have a proper fraction, right, then there are three things that um, you look at. First of all, you try to take the denominator uh, and factor it into factors of the form powers of linear factors, ax plus b, or powers of quadratic factors, ax squared plus bx plus c. And the idea here is that the presumption is that the quadratic factor is irreducible. What we mean there is something like x squared plus 1, which cannot be factored further, you know, at least over the real number system. Um, if you're looking at something like x squared minus 1, right, that can be factored further. That's a difference of squares. So here are the factors. Okay, so <clears throat> um, if you are already uh, done with this step and you've written the denominator q of x as a product of these two types of factors, then there are um, a couple of rules, right? For each linear factor, um, you include a, uh, you know, terms, might be multiple like this, in the partial fraction decomposition. For each quadratic factor, you include terms like this in the partial fraction decomposition. Um, this looks a little complicated, so I'm just going just to say two things here and then go to the example to illustrate it. First one is that notice that um, however, uh, you know, whatever n is, however many uh, factors of the linear factor ax plus b you have in the denominator in q of x, so whatever n is, there are that many terms in this expansion. Okay, so for example, if the denominator had a 1 over x minus 1 cubed, Right, then you would have uh, an a1 over x minus 1 plus an a1 over x minus 1 squared plus, uh, sorry, a2 plus a3 over x minus 1 cubed. Okay, so you have three factors here that correspond to this x minus 1 cubed, and each one of them gets an unknown constant, right? Its own unknown constant. That's why the subscripts are different a1, a2, a3. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, what if you only had uh, x minus 1 in the denominator? to the first, right? Just 1 over x minus 1. Well, then that gets a, an unknown constant uh, a1, and that's it. There's only one factor, right? Because it's x minus 1 to the first. OK, similar thing happens with the quadratic ones, right? If you have a denominator of 1 over x squared plus, I don't know, um, 1, let's say, uh, you know, squared, then that would give you a um, linear factor in the numerator over this quadratic uh, factor. A quadratic term, right? And then plus another linear c1 plus c2, another linear term in the numerator divided by the same quadratic uh, factor squared, right? And because there's two of them, you stop at these two terms. So two things I'm trying to impress on you there. Number one is the uh, power of the quadratic or linear factor that you've discovered in q of x, the denominator. Um, that power tells you how many terms, linear, 
or quadratic um, to add to your partial fraction decomposition. So that's um, takeaway number one. Takeaway number two is that uh, notice that in the linear portion of your partial fractions work, the numerator is a constant, whereas in the quadratic portion of your partial fractions uh, setup, the numerator is a linear function. So the degree, right, the highest power of x, is always one less than the denominator. Here, we're talking about linear factors, even though, you know, when you square this out, it's a quadratic, but the factors are inside the parentheses, and the numerator, therefore, is one degree less, so one degree less than linear is constant. Down here, we're talking about quadratic factors, and one degree less than quadratic is linear, so that explains why the numerators here are linear. So those are some general rules and just a quick little overview of what is on here in terms of these guidelines. You can see it's, it's a big uh, gray box. Uh, and these guidelines uh, are contained in the lesson notes for this lesson, lesson 24. So there's a lot more that's said before we get to the guidelines. You might want to take a look at all that setup and motivation and all that to add context to even what I just said. Uh, but let's go ahead and look at this example so we can see this in action. It says decompose the rational function below into a sum of simpler rational functions. Okay, great. So check number one, right? Is this number one? Is this proper fraction or uh, improper? Improper. Which one is it? Um, so we look at the degrees of the uh, uh, polynomials in the numerator and the denominator. This is degree two. And were we to multiply this out, we have 1x, 2x, 3x. This is degree three. So it is proper in this case because the numerator's degree is less than the denominator's degree. Great. Like I said earlier, we're going to start um, simple, proper fraction, great. And then we move on now to step number two. So now we're going to decompose this. Um, oops, I'll just leave that up. We're going to decompose this fraction. To do that, right, we are going to once again go back to our rules. So notice that the denominator has already been factored for us, right? If it hadn't been factored for us, then we have to go back to all the kind of factoring that we learned. Um, and I, I review some of this in the Calculus 1 playlist. Uh, you might want to check that out. That's early on in the course, uh, maybe the first two, three, four lessons. Um, there'll be videos on factoring if you want a refresher. Um, but like I said, this denominator is already factored. And notice that the only types of factors that there are here are linear factors. Okay? So we know from what we just talked about um, that we're going to have uh, we're going to contribute to our partial fractions decompositions, fractions that have these factors in the denominator and have constant terms in the numerator. Okay, that's number one. Number two, there are no squares, right? Nothing is being squared, so we're not going to have like the same factor contributing again with a square in the denominator. Okay, so um, we write over the fraction. Here's we're, we're going to do the actual expansion. So we write over this fraction. And then we say, all right, so um, this first one gets its own denominator. And the numerator is one less constant function, so we'll call it a1. Um, the second one, let me get a, uh, x minus 2 here, gets its own denominator. And then numerator, right? Well, we can call this a2 or, 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 b2 or b or c. You can use any letter you like. Um, I'm actually going to stick with the b over here and remove the 1 from the a. Call this b. So plus. Uh, and then x plus 2 gets its own denominator over here. So we'll call that c. <clears throat> All right, so this is the partial fractions decomposition, right? Um, I, I can't stress enough how important it is to run through these two steps in that order and then to talk through everything we just talked about. Because everything you do from here on out, if you have this particular setup incorrect, then your answers are not guaranteed to be actually a decomposition of this function into a sum of terms like this. Right, so it really is crucial to check for whether or not um, the original fraction is a proper fraction, and then to actually set up this initial um, sum of these factors in the right way. Okay, so now that we've done all that, let's go ahead and talk about how we solve for the unknown uh, constants a, b, and c. There are a variety of ways to do that, uh, but what I prefer is to do the following. So I'm going to multiply the entire equation by the denominator. So multiply here by this denominator. Um, the reason is that on the left-hand side, you know, this and this multiply and they cancel. So I'm just left with the numerator. Okay. On the right-hand side, you know, you can think about this in a variety of different ways, right? When this multiplies with that, 
the x's cancel. So I'm left with just this times a, okay? So I'm going to write that over here. So a times x minus 2, x plus 2. Now I'm going to show you, if you notice, that that's exactly this times this times a. So it's kind of like a cross multiplication, right? Whatever is up here gets multiplied with the denominators of the other terms, okay? But not its own denominator. So that's kind of the pattern of what's going to happen with the rest of the terms. So we'll use that to speed up our work a little bit. So plus b, b is here, so I'm going to multiply b with the denominators of the other terms. There we go. Great. And then same thing over here for c, so c is over here, plus c, multiply it with the denominators of the other terms, x, x minus 2. Okay. Um, so that is the, uh, oops, leave the red over here. So that is now, has converted the equation into one that's more usable. And from here, there are two real options. Um, one of them you'll see in some textbooks is that you multiply these out and you group together terms, right? For example, when you multiply this out, you're going to get an x squared. So there's going to be an ax squared. When you multiply this one, there's also going to be an x squared. So there's going to be a bx squared. Multiply this one, there's going to be an x squared. There's a cx squared. So if I were to combine these terms, I would get a plus b plus c x squared plus a bunch of other stuff, right? from the rest of the multiplications. And then you would compare on the left-hand side. You say, oh, the uh, x squared on the left-hand side, its coefficient is 5. The x squared on the right-hand side, its coefficient is a plus b plus c. So I'm going to set these two equal, right? So this method leads to a system of equations, which you're going to need to solve in uh, you know, however many variables you have. In this case, we have three. Um, a lot of times, this example included, we don't really need to do that. Uh, that will actually um, lengthen the, now, the amount of time it takes to solve the problem. So it'll be a little, end up being a little bit more work. So I'd prefer not to do that here, so I'm going to teach you the second way to do this, um, which actually a lot more textbooks these days are also teaching. I, I should notice that, uh, I should point out that even with the second approach I'm about to teach you, you will sometimes end up having to solve systems of equations. So that's that's for another day, but just to, kind of as a heads up. So what is the second approach? The second approach is the following. Um, this is supposed to be an equation, right? Uh, and this equation, uh, there's no information over here about you know what x values it works for, what x values it doesn't work for. So therefore, this is supposed to work for every x value. That means in particular that I can substitute in x values and then make sure that uh, and then get equations that relate a and, and other constants and maybe potentially solve for them without having to do a system of equations. So that leads to the question, which x values should you uh, substitute in? The answer is, look at the zeros right, of these denominators. What x values make these denominators zero? Well, this one is x equals zero. This one is x equals two. This one is x equals minus two. Those are really good x values to substitute in. Though again, like I said earlier, you could substitute in whatever x values you want. Um, why are these really good x values? Because that is going to not; those x values are going to knock out, you know, one, two uh, of these terms and leave only the other one. Make it easier for you. Uh, that'll make it easier for you to solve for a, b, and c. Let's see that in practice. So, uh, if x equals zero, if I substitute this into the equation, first of all, both of these are gone, so I'm left with negative 12 on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, notice that here's an x, here's an x. So these two terms cancel out, right? And if I put in x equals 0 here, I get um, negative 2 times 2. That's negative 4. So I get minus 4a. You can tell already that if I divide by negative 4, that gives me negative 12 over negative 4. That's 3. I have found my a value. No systems of equations needed, right? So again, this is the, the promise of doing this type of approach to um, figuring out the uh, a, B, and C values. Okay, so let's try this again then. So we did x equals 0. Now let's try x equals 2. So we go back, we do x equals 2. On the left-hand side, I have a 5 times 2 squared. 5 times 4, that's 20. Minus uh, 12 times 2, 24. Uh, and then minus 12. Um, on the right-hand side, I'll figure that out later. On the right-hand side, if x equals 2, this term is 0. Uh, and so is this term. So the only thing left is over here. And if x is 2, I have b times 2 times 4. 2 times 4, 8. So 8b. Okay. Um, and this tells me that over here, I have uh, negative 16 equals 8b. So b equals uh, negative 16 over 8. So that's minus 2. That's my b value. 
All right, and then last one to do, so we did uh, two, let's do negative two. So we go back and we do all of this over again for negative two. Um, on the left-hand side, x equals negative two. We get here, we get five times four again, that's 20. Um, over here, we have uh, plus 24. And then over here, we have minus 12. And then negative two um, makes this term zero. It makes this term zero, but not this one. So this is negative two, this is negative four, negative two times negative four, that's eight. So we have an eight C on the right-hand side. Uh, Left-hand side simplifies to 32, so um, 44 minus 12, equals 8C. So I get C equals 32 over 8, so that is 4. Okay, so what is the takeaway, right? I now have my A, B, and C values. So if I um, remove all the clutter here, right, I can then finally go back to my original expansion, which is right there. And I can substitute in my A, B, and C values. And I will have accomplished the uh, goal, which is to decompose the original rational function into one which is simpler, right? So A here is 3. That went there. Uh, B is negative 2. That goes there. And then C is 4. That goes here. OK, let's just turn this into the same color. Uh, and then one little thing I'll do is I'll take this negative on the 2 and I'll put it in front. Okay, and this is the decomposition of this original complicated looking rational function. Imagine integrating this, right? That's where we're heading in this lesson. Um, uh, decomposition into this, right? This is an equality, so they're, they're equal. Both these sides are equal. So I would much rather integrate this than I would that, right? And that's kind of the uh, whole point of partial fraction decomposition. Um, last thing to mention here, because I mentioned a few minutes earlier, this technique is so important to, it's so important to, in the beginning, right, get the right decomposition to start with. Um, I might encourage you to check your work here before you go any further, if you're going to use this for integration purposes or something like that, right? Because, again, if, if the numbers are wrong or if the denominators are off, then everything else is going to be off. Um, you might be wondering how you would check your work. Well, you, you start here and you combine this into one fraction and you make sure that you get that on the right-hand side. Right. How would you do this? In this case, for example, you'd find this common denominator, and then you would start multiplying, right? So this term would be 3 times its denominators over here, x minus 2, x plus 2. This term would be minus 2 times the denominators that, that you know, it doesn't have, so x, x plus 2, right? And then this term over here would be plus 4 times the denominators that it doesn't have, so x minus 2, x. And then you would simplify this numerator. When you simplify the numerator, you should get the original numerator. right? Then you'll know that the denominators match, the numerators match, so the fractions will be the same. And you will have checked your work for partial fractions. Great, thanks for watching.